think our next speaker is almost like he's from the cradle. He's such a young one. <laughs> I can say that because I'm a lot older than people think I am. And I was very encouraged to see that Father Jerome, just at the tender age of 24, found his calling to the priesthood. He has been a priest for just over two years now. Father Jerome is currently the associate pastor at St. Albert the Great, and a mentor as well, and Father Kevin. He's originally from Hull, Quebec, but has been living in Alberta since the mid-80s. I think I had already graduated high school by then, so I'm feeling really old now. <laughs> Father Jerome has been serving the people of God as a priest, as I mentioned, for over two years, but if you can't find him at the church, he says you can find him enjoying the outdoors, doing fishing or hunting share his message in breaking the kingdom. Please welcome Father Jerome. There's a scene in Spielberg's motion picture entitled Schindler's List that I believe truly encapsulates for us the business of humanity going on as we speak on a global scale. At this one particular point in the movie, Oscar finds himself drinking with Amon Geth, who's an SS commandant, bloodthirsty man, who's in charge of watching over one of the Jewish labor camps. Oscar asks Amon a question. Do you know what real power is? No, what's that? Real power is knowing that you have all the rights to kill someone and choosing not to. That's power. That's real power. The scene then switches to the next afternoon of the next day and Ammon is found entering into a horse stable. He sees a young Jewish boy laying the horse saddle down on the ground, filled with rage. Ammon cries out, what are you doing? Don't you know that that saddle is worth more than your life? The little boy can't speak, he's shaken, frozen. Suddenly Ammon gently reaches out his right hand, taps the little boy on the forehead and says, I pardon you. The little boy is then seen running as fast as his little legs will carry him back towards the safety of the barracks. But then, gunshots are heard ringing out throughout the atmosphere. And then the little boy is seen, laying face down in the dust, shot through the back. Within every 24-hour time span, human beings are doing one of three things. Either we're hot and busy, going about in-breaking the kingdom of God, or we're lukewarm and nonchalant about everything and not about much of anything, not doing much about the kingdom, or we're breaking out in a cold sweat, going about in-breaking the kingdom of Satan. Oh, how I wish you were either hot or cold, says the Lord, but seeing as you are lukewarm, I feel vomit you out of my mouth. Revelation 3.16. That settles that question. Out of the three things that we're either doing at any given time, two out of the three don't seem they're going to end up getting us good results at the end of days. Ammon stands before us today as an extreme example but nonetheless a real example of what can happen to anyone who tries to manifest love, who tries to be an agent of forgiveness in this world, cut off from he who is love, from he who is forgiveness. That's the reason 
why life must go on differently once the Mass ends. Because when we gather for the Mass, we're transcending our human experience. We're in a different time, a different space, a different place. Make no mistake about it, there is nothing ordinary about that hour. During that hour, we are literally being spliced into the movement of Trinitarian love. And once we're inside that movement of a self-emptying God into our very being, we experience in our midst the incarnation of the Father's forgiveness as bread and wine are transubstantiated into divine flesh, into divine blood. And, and if that's not enough, we're then going to take that reality and we're going to pour it down our throats so that, like what Father Kevin says, it can flow throughout our veins. And that's why, that's why after we are sent out, because we are filled, we're full of light, we're full of life. You can't get that out of Tim Horton's drive through <laughs> You can't find it on the internet. We get that new life, we become that new light that shines in the darkness only at the Lamb's Supper. Because the Eucharist is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is the brightness of the Father's glory. This is big. It's worthy of awe, of wonder, of reverential fear, and of our worship. Because during the Mass, He who abides in our midst is light, is life itself. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10, verse 9. Those words from our God, they demand a response from our part. We inbreak the kingdom when we put to death within us, when we sacrifice as the priests that we are made in baptism, all that is earthly. And we give permission to the Spirit to transform us into an instrument of enfleshed love, an instrument of enfleshed forgiveness. And then we bust through those doors and we go out there and live that reality outside the confines of the church walls. Pope Benedict puts it this way in Sacramentum Caritatis. The conversion of bread and wine into his body and blood introduces within creation the principle of a radical change. It's a sort of nuclear fission, to use an image that is familiar to us today. It penetrates to the heart of all being, a change that is meant to set off a process that transforms reality a process leading ultimately to the transfiguration of the entire world to the point where God may be all in all. Within every 24-hour time span, we're building up one of two kingdoms. If our lives were to come to an end this evening, which ruler would have us as his eternal subject?